Father, we come now to your word and we trust that as it tells us, it is living and active, able to change our lives, penetrate our hearts if we are open to it. So open us, we pray, in Jesus' name, the living word. Amen. Well, this is the, I've given this sermon now, this will be the fourth time in the last, since last night. It's the final finale in our summer-long series called Hand Me Another Brick, a study of the book of Nehemiah. I don't know, I know summer is kind of, uh, uh, for some of you, you're in and out, you're coming and going, and, but if you've been tracking with us, I hope you feel like I have, it's been a fun journey to see this story unfold week after week, and see, even those of us that have read it and know how it ends, it's a remarkable story, it has a lot to teach us, and I've enjoyed uh, not only preaching in it, but also hearing the sermons and studying it and reading it myself. Uh, the first half of the book, as you might remember, is really all about the reconstruction of the wall. Nehemiah, living in, uh, far away in Babylonian captivity under the Persian rule, hears about the condition of the people in Jerusalem. His heart is broken. He stands before the king. He asks for permission. He's given the resources. He goes back to Jerusalem. And then we get the rebuilding of the wall story. But that's done by the end of chapter 6, early chapter 7. The second half of the book of Nehemiah, 8 through 13, is not about the wall. The wall's finished. It's about the restoration of God's people. And that's, I think, the overarching lesson this morning is the reconstruction of the wall only makes sense if it's about the restoration of God's people. Those things have to go together. Otherwise, the wall makes no sense. It has no point. And then the second half of the story is about the spiritual rebuilding, not the physical rebuilding. In chapter 8, Ezra reads the law out loud. God's people hear the law, and in chapter 9, they are convicted of their sin, they repent of their sin and confess it. And in chapter 10, we read about the reestablishment of the covenant. Not, of course, because God broke it, but because we had, God's people had, and they are now re reestablished as his people. It's really an amazing story. All of this is about the spiritual restoration, not the physical reconstruction. And when you first read through chapters 11 and 12, where we'll be this morning as we wrap up, you might be tempted to wonder, why does God write it that way at the close of the story? Why put all of this in the Bible? I'll show you what I mean. Let's open to chapter 12, and let's read the first 11 verses or so. Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 1. These are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Jeshua, Shariah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Amariah, Maluk, Hattush, Shechaniah, Rehum, Meramoth, Ido, Genethoi, Abijah, Mijamin, Madiah, Bilga, Shemaiah, Joiarib, Jediah, Salu, Amok, Hilkiah, Jediah, these were the chief priests, chief of the priests and of their brothers in the days of Jeshua. And the Levites, Jeshua, Minuai, Cadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, Mataniah, who with his brothers was in charge of the songs of thanksgiving, and Bakbukiah and Unai, and their brothers stood opposite them in the service. And Jeshua was the father of Joiakim, Joiakim the father of Eliashib, Eliashib the father of Joida, Joida the father of Jonathan, and Jonathan the father of Jadua. We'll stop there because... We just will. Right? <laughs> because that's all I practiced, right? From chapter 11, verse 3, right on through to 12, verse 26, that's how the whole thing reads. Name after name after name after name. That's not the first time in the book of Nehemiah we see lists of names, is it? No. We, Nehemiah seems to have a thing for lists of unpronounceable names. He likes them. He lists lots of them. And I think we have to ask the question, why? Why are they all in there? I mean, he, he even categorizes them. He gives you the names of the priests and of the Levites. And have you, have you ever wondered what the difference between priests and Levites is? You ever wondered that? I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you. <laughs> priests are descendants of Aaron in the Old Testament, the Aaronic priesthood. And they have sp specific duties for offering sacrifice in the temple outlined in the book of Leviticus. Levites, uh, they're from the tribe of Levi, connected to the priests in that they assist the priests in their work in the temple. They're kind of like junior varsity priests, except they're never going to make it to varsity. Does that make sense? They, they, they're over, they, they assist the priests. They are in charge of worship and music and doing other things to help the priests fulfill their obligations and offering sacrifices. So, so together, the priests and the Levites, and by the way, out of the Levites came the musicians and the singers and those who led the songs of praise. They all together make up those who help God's people worship. And there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of them, actually, in this time. They're all listed for us. Why all these names? Not just the priests and Levites, but the regular people who came back to the town and their descendants. Why? We don't know much about them. They're not, we, they're not described elsewhere, most of them anyway. We can hardly even pronounce them. Why are they in there? 
Well, the point actually is really simple. But I think the most profound things in our life and our faith often are the most simple. The point is simply that people matter to God. People matter to God. To God, this is not a list of ancient and unpronounceable names. These are flesh and blood, men and women, with children and families and spouses, with hopes and dreams, with victories and failures, with joys and successes and defeats, regrets. And he knows all about it. My favorite, Bak Bukaya. God knows him, loves him intimately, knows all about his life, even if I don't. I read one commentator who said, these names, these lists of names are symbolic of the reestablishment of authentic worship and religious life for the nation of Israel. Well, I think that's true, but I think there's more going on. They're not just symbolic. They're actual people who matter to God. Imagine your name discovered a thousand years from now on some list, right? Some future archaeologist discovers an ancient flash drive buried in the ground, dusts it off, plugs it into an old computer, up comes your name on a list like a school roster or a bank account list of names, I don't know, a list of hundreds of names, and your name's on it. To that person, you're an unknowable name from the past. Never to God. Never to God. Knows you. The next time you read through the Bible and you come through a long list of names, you think, oh, I gotta read these. Just pause and think, God knows those people. And he knows me too. He knows all about me. You are never just a name on a list to him. It was all about your life, and you matter to him. Derek Kidner, a great Old Testament scholar, writes, it is not bureaucratic pedantry that has preserved these names for us. The point is that these people and their chronicler are conscious of their roots and their structure and identity as God's company. In other words, they're God's people, and God knows them and loves them. Kidder goes on to say, this is no mere rabble of refugees settling down anywhere. They have the dignity and the identity of known relationships, and above all, they're calling to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You see, there's a deep sense of identity they share. Remember, for a hundred years, Jerusalem was rubble, and God's people a non-factor on the world scene. And now, after over a century, they're back together. Their identity is restored. Their future is restored. Their hope and their joy is restored. I'm not sure we always have that as God's people in the church today. That deep sense of shared identity in Christ. So let's look then at some of the key characteristics of living as God's people from chapters 11 and 12, both then and now. The first characteristic is they are a willing people. Willing people. Now, Nehemiah had finally rebuilt the wall. It's done. But there's an issue. So the temple's restored, the wall's rebuilt, but the problem is there's no people in the city. Only a few of the leaders are in the city. The city's not full of people, and Nehemiah knows what good is the wall if there aren't people inside of it living and thriving and worshiping. And there's a reason why there's no people in the city. Think about it. The city was rubble. There was not much going on there. There was no trade, no economy, no commerce, no, no social life, no cultural center. It was all gone. They had all fled to the suburbs, if you will, to the surrounding villages. That's where the jobs were. That's where the agriculture was. That's where the, the trade was going on. He has to get them to come back. In verses, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, we see how this happens. Let's read those verses. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city while nine out of ten remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. Let's talk about what's going on there. Nehemiah has them all cast lots. Where have you heard that phrase, casting lots, before in the Bible? Right? They cast lots for Jesus' garments. The soldiers did. The disciples cast lots to see who will replace Judas, and they choose Matthias. It happens frequently in the Old Testament and in the New it's not an ancient form of gambling. When believers do it, it's a way of acknowledging this decision is beyond us. We're trusting it to your providence, God. I'm not suggesting that we make all of our decisions in the church by casting lots. What I am saying, what's happening here is they're saying that we want God to decide. That's the symbolism there. Now, it's, it's easy to read this and think, okay, nobody wants to come back. And they gamble. And those who lose the dice roll, oh, you have to go back. Oh, no. That's not what's going on here. In fact, in verse 2, we're told they blessed those who were willing. 
to return. The implication seems to be that there's so much excitement about what's happening that there's more people that want to come back than they can accommodate. And they have to have a fair way of determining who gets to come back to the city and who doesn't. And that's why they cast lots. They choose one out of ten. By the way, in chapter 11, each little section ends with a number of men. If you add all those numbers of men, you get a little over 3,000 men. And men represent families. So you're talking about, give or take, 10,000 people who come back. And that's one-tenth of the immediate surrounding population of 100,000 people. So 10,000 people are willing to come back to the city. To move back in. And here's the question for us. Are you willing... Are you a willing person? Are you willing to go where God wants you to go? To do what he wants you to do? Whatever that is. To live where he wants you to live. How many of you have moved in your lifetime as an adult? Okay. Yeah. When you decided to move, my guess is you, you, you had some things that you considered. Like, for example, what are the schools like in this town? that my kids will attend. That's a good thing to think about. What are the schools like? What's their reputation? I know you thought about the taxes. What are the taxes like in this community? How much is it gonna cost me? We all think about that. You probably thought about, does this community have the amenities that I want? They have a rec center, a pool, how close to shopping, is it my, if I, my commute to work? All these things we consider. And they're not wrong, they're natural things for us to consider in the suburbs. How many of us, how many Christ followers in the American suburbs today Ever stop and think, God, do you want me here? Is it your will that I live here on this street, in this house? Even to consider the question, or where do you want me to go? Are we willing? Years ago, when I took our first trip to Roseland with high school students, about 15 years ago, I met a man named Reverend Tony Van Zanten, a white Dutch guy from Iowa who God called to pastor a church in the far south side of Chicago in Roseland community. He said, God has a sense of humor. It's an all-African-American church. Very dangerous neighborhood. Poor schools, high crime, violent crime. You know that if you pay attention to the news today. It was the same then. I asked him where he lived, he and his family and his children, assuming they lived probably outside of Roseland. He said, oh, just down the street, right up there. I thought, really, you live in this community? He said, yeah. I thought, why? I didn't say it. I wanted to sound spiritual and pastoral, you know. But I thought, why? You know, you, these schools are terrible. Your kids, you, could, you don't have to live here. He knew what I was thinking. He said, Brother Jeff, has it ever occurred to you that God does not picture heaven as a suburb? <laughs> God does not picture heaven as a vacation spot from which we get away from it all for eternity? God pictures heaven as what? A city. The new Jerusalem coming down in which God's people live in harmony and in peace by his spirit. I've never forgotten that. Not suggesting we all move to the south side. I am saying we need to ask ourselves if we consider ourselves God's people, how willing are we? How willing am I? Give something up to go, to do, to live, wherever God calls me. Am I willing? The second characteristic of God's people is that they are not only willing, but they're worshiping people. The first half of chapter 12 lists all the names we were reading. The second half tells this amazing story about the dedication of the temple, the t uh, of the wall, excuse me. The wall's been built, and they're going to have a great celebration to dedicate it. It's a really an amazing story. Nehemiah gathers all the priests and the Levites. Now, did I talk to you about priests and Levites yet? I told you the difference, right? He brings, I can't remember what I said at what service, so I did say that? Yeah, JV, okay, good. He brings them all together, uh, hundreds of them from villages outside of, of Jerusalem. He gathers them all in, hundreds of them. And he divides them up into two massive choirs. And we read in verse 30 that first they purify themselves and they purify the people. What does that mean, purified themselves? Well, in the Old Testament, purification rites were a complex form of ritualistic cleansing outlined in the book of Leviticus by which you had to go through to stand in God's presence to be clean before God. The priests purified themselves and then they led the people through the same rites. So they would all be ceremonially clean in God's sight. What does it mean for us when we come to worship? How do we purify ourselves? 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to purify us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As Christians, as Christ followers today, Christ fulfilled all those ceremonial laws about being clean before God were symbolically pointing to what Jesus did on the cross. 
He purifies us. He forgives our sin. He makes us clean. You remember Matthew 13 when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet before the Last Supper? And Peter says, you shouldn't wash me. I should be washing you. And Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And so what does Peter say? Well, give me a bath then, right? Okay, bring it on. I want the whole thing. And Jesus says something very interesting to Peter. He says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. What's the word? What's Jesus talking about? The word is grace. Because of what he has done in our lives at the cross, we're clean. We're made clean. So when we come together to worship, we are reminded of the purification, the cleansing, the cleanness we already have in Christ. And we pour out our hearts in worship to him. What's happening here in Nehemiah 12 is pointing to that forward. Being purified. Now, let's read verse, a few verses out of chapter 12 and get a sense for this, this whole celebration, dedication. Verse 31. Chapter 12, verse 31. Then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. One went to the south on the wall to the dung gate. Verse 38. The other choir of those who gave thanks went to the north, and I followed with them, with half the people on the wall above the tower of the ovens to the broad wall. Verse 40. So both choirs of those who gave thanks stood in the house of God, and I and half the officials with me. Here's what's going on. Nehemiah brings in all the priests and Levites, the singers, the musicians, the priests, and the, and the temple servants, hundreds and hundreds of people. He divides them into two massive choirs of several hundred each. He puts them on top of the wall. Now, in the city, below the wall, would have been the 10,000 living there and the 100,000 from outside. They don't want to miss the show. They're in town as well. So it's standing room only, shoulder to shoulder. The city's jammed with people, 100,000 or more. Several hundred priests, Levites, musicians, and singers go in opposite directions in two choirs, one to the north, one to the south, around the wall, four and a half miles. They march around the wall, and they finish at exactly the same point right above the temple where they descend and go in for the sacrifices of dedication. This would have been an astounding sight. Think about if you're just one of the regular folk standing in the city with massive choirs marching around above your head, singing the songs, the psalms and songs of your faith back and forth over your head. Psalm 48, 1, in the city of God, we praise him. We lift your name high in your city right back and forth, and you're, it would have been overwhelming. No Super Bowl halftime show can touch this. It would have been, you ever have a moment in worship where the content of what you're saying and just the power of the music, just, you, you're sort of lifted, and you have almost an out-of-body experience? Just, if you haven't, I hope you do. This would have been that times a thousand, I think. Almost hard to stay on your feet. It would have been so emotional, so overwhelming. A worshiping people. The power would have been incredible. Now, I want to take you back for a minute to Nehemiah chapter 4. In Nehemiah chapter 4, two guys named Sanballat and Tobiah, who pop up periodically in the early stages of Nehemiah, are taunting and uh, ridiculing Nehemiah and those who are building the wall. And Tobiah, sort of Sanballat's sidekick, he pops up and he, said, he has a specific taunt. He says, if even a fox climbed on this wall, it would crumble. Remember that? And Nehemiah prays, oh God, turn back their taunts on their own heads. Well, chapter 12, God did that. Because there's not a fox on the wall. There's hundreds and hundreds of musicians and singers and priests on the wall marching around the city. It's an amazing sight. There was a time in chapter 4 and before when it didn't look like it was going to happen. When the outcome was uncertain. Do we have the willpower and the faith and the resources to finish this thing? And now God's done it. And they're celebrating. So God's people are a willing people. They are a worshiping people. And they're also a joyful people. Look at how the whole scene ends. Verse 43. And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. I'm going to read that again, and I want you to listen closely and see if you pick up a theme. And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. And the women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. Did you catch it? <laughs> There's an intentional re repetition here. These people seem to enjoy themselves. They're not like, oh, when is this whole choir on the wall thing over and we can eat? Like, you know, that... 
They're, they're enjoying it. This is, there's no place else they'd rather be than right there worshiping God, full of joy in that moment. Now, I'm not always that way when I come to worship, and I'm guessing you're not always either. But God's people in the world are to be joyful. Joy, of course, is not the same thing as circumstantial happiness. Joy is not an emotional response to how you perceive your life is going at any given moment. You can have deep, lasting joy and even rejoice when things aren't going that great in the moment because of what God has done and will do. Remember, for over a hundred years, Jerusalem was nothing, rubble. The people were scattered. And now they're to back. It's like, we're back. We're back as God's people. He's, he's reestablished the covenant with us. He's restored us. And I was thinking about this last week. We today, as God's people, have greater reason for joy, greater cause to rejoice than anyone in Nehemiah's day. Do you know that? I mean, you may know it. Do you know it? We have greater cause to rejoice than anyone in Nehemiah's day. Why is that? There's a name that's the reason. You can't get this wrong. It's the, the church answer. It starts with J. <laughs> so let's say it together. Jesus. This is all pointing to what Jesus would do. We today know for certainty that God has restored us. We know for a fact that he's forgiven us. We have absolute rock solid guarantee that our future is secure and that our life with him has purpose and meaning now. We have greater cause to rejoice because of what God has done than anyone in Nehemiah's day. Jesus said the same thing in John 15 11. He says, I tell you these things so that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be complete. It's complete because of Christ. As great as that choir celebration was, it was partial. C.S. Lewis once wrote, the joy, joy is the serious business of heaven. I love that line. It's not frivolous, playful, wasting time. Joy, rejoicing, is serious business in heaven. It's what we're made for. Now, the most fascinating part to me of this verse 43 is the last line. And the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. What was heard far away? Not their singing, not their shouting, not their playing. Of course, they were doing all that. But it specifically says the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. Some text translations say that the sound of the rejoicing, but the actual, the construction of the, of the phrase in the original language does say their joy was heard. Now, let me ask a question. Is our joy heard, seen, noticed by those outside these walls. I don't mean how loud are we, of course that, that matters, but I mean, is the joy of Christ in your heart and in mine evident to people outside the walls of this place? Or is it something we keep to ourselves and we kind of show a little bit once a week on Sunday? The joy of God's people is to be seen, heard, and noticed by those outside of his family, because people matter to God. Is the joy that you have in knowing that God loves you and has forgiven you and redeems you and has a plan for your life, is that joy evident in the way you treat people, talk to people? Is it evident in your family, in your life, at work? Is it known outside these walls? God's people are to be a willing people, a worshiping people, a joyful people, and finally, a generous people. Now, it should be no surprise to us that joy is connected to generosity. Those two things, I think, naturally go together. The most joyful people are, by nature, generous people. And I don't just mean financially. I mean with their lives, with their words of affirmation and encouragement, with their time. They're just generous at heart, big-hearted. But let's read verse 44 and try to make sense of what's happening here at the close of chapter 12. On that day, men were appointed over the storerooms, the contributions, the first fruits, and the tithes to gather into them the portions required by the law for the priests and for the Levites, according to the fields of the towns, for Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. It goes on like that. I have to be honest, when I read chapter 12 again in preparation last week, I thought, I don't think I would have written it that way. Let's all be glad I didn't write it. But I would have sort of finished the chapter with the great choirs, wouldn't you? That's how Hollywood would do it. 
the finale, the choirs on the wall, marching around, the big show. That's how you finish the story. Why this, these last verses about storerooms and tithes and administration and organization? I mean, blech, who wants to fo- focus on that? That's not exciting. I think it's an important lesson for us here. The point here is that the dedication of the wall, the great celebration, is not the end of the story. It's the beginning. It's a new beginning. It's, God didn't re- re- have God's people return and restore them and rebuild the temple and the wall just so they could have a party and be done. They're just getting started again as God's people in the world. And this last section about the giving, the resources, and the organization of it, and the distribution of it is important because it shows us the people get this. This has to go on. We have to continue. We have to continue with the worship and the teaching and the reaching of people and the spreading of the joy. It doesn't stop now. It starts. And we've got to provide for that to continue. As we near the completion then of the East Campus renovation, I hope you get a chance next weekend to go over there and see all of that. It's pretty exciting. But it doesn't matter if it isn't about the people and ultimately God's glory. What difference does it make? You know, there's a new lobby over there. It's got a two-sided fireplace. There are bookshelves behind it, full of books, hopefully this week, which is cool. What, 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 what's the point of a nice new lobby if it isn't full of people? Connecting, meeting each other, greeting each other, praying for each other. What's the point of the new office complex? I have a new office over there at the East Campus. Very excited about my office. I even got a window. What's the point of an office complex if it isn't full of staff members who love each other, are praying together, and daily are meeting together and doing God's work, serving him with joy? What's the point of the masterpiece rooms we're building here on both levels, fully equipped? What's the point of that if they're not full of children, beautiful children, being loved and encouraged and taught and shown the love of God? What's the point of of any of this stuff? What's the point here uh, of, of the space we'll build eventually? New worship venue here, or the expansion of the south, or over the east campus, if you get a chance to go over there. What's the point of our Shepherd's Heart Care Center, which houses our food pantry, if it isn't full on a daily basis of people coming to be clothed and fed and encouraged and provided for? What's the point of our east campus sanctuary renovations? Or any of the facilities we'll build for worship, if they're not full of men, women, and children pouring out their hearts to God in worship? None of it makes any sense. It's never about the wall. It's about the people. So friends, as we come to the close of this sermon series and the close of phase one of Growing to Serve, I, I want to remind you, we are not almost done with Growing to Serve. We are just getting started. Let's stand together for closing prayer. And as I, after I pray, if you're here and like someone to pray with you personally, Feel free to come down front. Members of the prayer team will meet with you here. We'd love to pray with you after the service. Father, we thank you for pouring out your grace on us through Jesus. We thank you for calling us to be part of your family and giving us this church. We want to play our part for your kingdom and in this world well. We want to be, by your spirit, a willing, worshiping, joyful, and generous people. God, thank you for providing the resources you have for us to expand our facilities. Help us never to forget that it's because of the people and ultimately for your glory. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and go in peace.